Welcome to the Deadly Dynasties podcast, where we talk all about how great monarchs rose to power, the events that unfolded during their reign, and what led to their demise. I am your host, DJ Hill. Let us imagine an alternate reality of the modern age, one where the country of Mexico is no longer the sovereign, unified country it is today, but instead is merely a confederation of multiple tribes. Now, let's say in America, life is relatively unchanged, that we are just as advanced in society as we are today, and that we have all the technology that is available to us in this day and age. And one thing that's been on the news quite frequently in recent history was the construction of a U.S.-Mexico border wall. And this wall was intended to keep out unwanted foreign presence. Now, let's just pretend that over the past several decades, this wall was fully funded and fully built, and it was a magnificent sight to see. This tall, formidable wall that stretched out miles from sea to sea. And that this wall was fully manned with its own form of United States sponsored force. Surely, given the odds that on the other side of that bordered wall was just a grouping of barbaric, squabbling tribesmen living in the country that is as developed and civilized as the United States, you couldn't merely feel any threat from the South. But let's speculate that one day you receive news that the various tribes that are present down in Mexico, the barbaric warlords and the primitive clansmen that existed down in Mexico, let's just say that they have all unanimously banded under one unknown leader. A man who we have never heard of before. A man who came from, for lack of a better word, nowhere. And let's just say that this new uniformed super tribe that formed under this one man threatened to move north and overthrow everything you came to love and know about life in America? Would you be the person that would instantly feel fearful and pack up all of your belongings, gather your family, maybe quit your job, sell your house if need be, get as much money as you can from the bank, liquidate all your assets, and pack your bags, head to the nearest airport, and fly out of the country of America? Maybe go over to Europe where maybe life is a little more stable and you don't have the ever-pressing threat from the South. Or would you continue your life as things are normal, trusting in the fact that you have a stable, strong, and unwavering government that is there to protect your way of life? And by doing so, you have faith in the security down at the border that they can repel any foreign invaders because that's what that wall was designed to do. And for decades, that's what that wall did. But let's just say some years pass and this ever-pressing threat from the South decided to make their moves and... They made their moves along one section of the wall and were successful. They broke through and started claiming various sections 
of Southern America. Now, maybe you live up in the northern portion of America and you aren't threatened. You still have faith that the government can take control of the pressing situation and repel the enemy back down to where they belong, patch up the wall, and continue life as normal. But as time goes on, this isn't the case. They continue gaining more stronghold until all of America is completely overthrown. Now, while this story was completely fabricated in every sense, nearly 800 years ago, and on the other side of the world, a very real-life set of events unfolded that forever changed the future of the world. The year is 1211, and for nearly 1900 years, that's 1,000 900 years, the Great Wall of China has stood the testament of time for one sole purpose, to keep China's enemies out of China. It was one of man's greatest achievements. It was revered as one of the great wonders of the world, of which there are only seven. And then for nearly 2,000 years, it is held up against every single attempt by numerous military efforts to break and falter. Until one day in the year 1211, when a military of an unimaginable size amasses from the north and the west, they breach the gates and flood into the rest of what we knew as Imperial China. Now imagine what life must have been like in China during this time, very much like the scenario we painted in the beginning. You were living in a civilized culture, and these barbaric tribesmen from the West broke through your first line of defense and threatened to take hold of the rest of your country. But surely, after so many uncontested years, it would almost certainly be regarded as the unbreakable wall, impenetrable by any man's effort. But when faced with the reality that the impossible just became possible, I could only imagine the only reaction would be one thing. Fear. Fear when an enemy, hundreds of thousands strong, stomped through your front door. They didn't want revenge. They didn't want money. They wanted to do one thing. Conquer. And they were there on the orders of a man whose name was Temujin. Or more famously known as Genghis Khan. When I think about great leaders in our history that largely influenced and impacted our future, I can think of no one that compares to Genghis Khan. Everywhere you look in the modern world, Genghis Khan's footprint still remains. Statistically speaking, one in every 200 people are related directly to Genghis Khan. Now, I didn't do a ancestry background search to see if I am related to Genghis Khan, but statistically speaking, there's about a half a percent chance that I am actually related to Genghis Khan. And based on that fact alone, I believe Genghis Khan is someone we all should try to study. Genghis Khan's story is so incredibly long and complicated, I've decided as opposed to compiling this entire series into one episode, we'll break up this story into a mini-series of a few episodes that are approximately 45 minutes or so in length. 
There's a lot about Genghis Khan that is entirely necessary to talk about that will further immerse you into this environment and into the setting that was put in place that allowed Genghis Khan to become the conqueror that he would become. The history of Mongolia can be traced all the way back to Chinese transcripts dated in the 9th century. Mongolia wasn't ruled by a sovereign power, so to speak, like, you know, the United States of America is sovereign in the sense that it is ruled by a single person, a president that resides over the entire land in a sole government. However, Mongolia is more of a confederation of multiple provinces that they all kind of exist together. And within these provinces are further tribes and then clans within the tribes. And then it just keeps breaking down into different households. And these different provinces had very unique relationships between each other, of which is incredibly important to talk about in order for you to understand the climate that Genghis Khan was being raised up in. So the five main provinces that were around the lands of Mongolia were obviously the Mongols, the Merkits, Tartars, Karits, and Naimans. So like I said, with these five different provinces, there existed a very unique relationship between each province. The most powerful province within this land were the Naimans, and they shared a very strong alliance with the second most powerful province, who were the Karits. Then there were the Tartars, who were known as China's secret weapon. They were the spies that did the dirty work for the Chinese out in the West. And they were highly influenced by the Jin Dynasty. Now, there's a previous episode where we talk all about the rise of the Jin Dynasty and what they all went through as a up-and-coming dynasty. And that's a previous episode that if you'd like to check out, there's a link in the description below. And if you're listening via podcast app or any other medium, you can check out my other episodes on the main page. So what the Jinns were doing at this time were they were continually trying to destabilize the region by promoting and provoking tribal wars in Mongolia to prevent any one tribe from gaining too much power and superiority where they could possibly overthrow China. The Tartars and the Karits were longtime natural enemies of one another and were constantly going to war at each other. There were even records that indicated in the 12th century there was large-scale battles that took place between the Karits and the Tartars, with numbers as high as 40,000 men per side. The Merkits were largely a fragmented province and they were separated into three distinct groups of people. Each of the branches believed and followed a different political structure, and that belittled the Merkit's strength as a whole. And then, in the center of all of this, lies the Mongols. The Mongols lived on a land known as the Steppes. The Steppes gets its name because largely the land of Mongolia was a plateau, and the plateau had multiple elevations of very flat land, and so hence they got the name Steppes to replicate a staircase or stairwell. And the Mongols spread across this land and lived a lifestyle known as nomadic pastoralism. That meant that they were nomads or people that constantly were on the move. The Mongols would move as often as two to four times every year. This meant that the Mongols, who were made up of a bunch of different tribes, 13, I believe, was the recorded number, but we're going to break down those tribes as we uh, go further into this discussion. But these different tribes would spread across the land and they would adopt this nomadic pastoralism policy or lifestyle and they would move 
in line with wherever their livestock move. So they believe that the livestock always knew where the most fertile, the best land was. And so they were willing to uproot their own lives to follow their own cattle and their own livestock and their sheep and goats and what have you. So to accommodate this kind of rapid mobilization that the Mongols would adopt, they lived in very easy to construct and deconstruct houses known as gurs. And these gurs were constructed with animal skins and wooden logs that were placed together to house an entire family. But within it, there was really no foundation that made that residency permanent. As far as the hygienic side of the Mongols, a lot of people said that they were extremely dirty people. And for the most part, guys, this was largely true. For example, the Mongols would stop mid-conversation and urinate or defecate right in front of the person they were talking to. When it came to food, the Mongols had a rather unique diet. In the summertime, the Mongols would consume mare's milk or milk products like cheese or yogurt. And then in the wintertime is when they saved for their meats. And when I say meats, I mean they would literally consume any meat that was readily available. This meant cats, dogs, mice, even lice if it had to come to it. And then in the most extreme cases where there is a great famine, the Mongols were known to eat each other. That's right, there were reports of cannibalism within the Mongol tribes. As far as how the meat was made, it was made into a gruel from boiled millet, which sounds appetizing, right? And then this gruel was placed into a common pot at which the whole family would use their hands and grab this meat mixture out of the pot and consume it. If you were higher up the social ladder, you would have the luxury of being able to consume meat any time of the year. From time to time, and by that I mean probably on a near daily basis, the Mongols did enjoy their fair share of alcoholic beverages. The alcoholic beverage of choice for the Mongols was kumis. And kumis was this alcoholic beverage made from mare's milk normally. And it was a cloudy white liquid that was said to be pretty bitter with a slight hint of almond. And it was stored inside leather bags and hung inside of the gur, which was their mobile house that they would construct. Kumis had a relatively low alcohol content. It was said to be roughly 3% alcohol, which is extremely low as far as alcohol standards are. So in order to get drunk, the Mongols had to compensate by drinking large quantities of this kumis. And so the Mongols as a whole became very accustomed to drinking very large amounts of alcohol. This did end up playing a rather major role in the future of the Mongols as they started to become influenced by other cultures and getting introduced to their alcohol, which typically had much higher alcohol content. Because the Mongols would still drink the large quantities of alcohol, but instead of getting drunk now, they were essentially getting plastered by these other cultures' alcohol. However, in traditional Mongol ways, they would often celebrate their drunkenness, force vomiting, and then they would continue to drink and consume as much alcohol as they pleased. So now we're going to break down these different tribes that were within the Mongol tribe and then work our way down to where Genghis Khan came from. So the two primary tribes within the Mongol province were the Burjigit tribe and the Taichid tribe. There was a strong tension between both of the tribes just due to the innate power struggle between the two. However, by the early 12th century, 
the Mongols were united, all of the tribes were united under the leader Kabul, who represented the Borjidid tribe. Now, this didn't mean that all of the other tribes disappeared, but they, in a sense, paid homage to the Borjidid tribe, and most importantly, listened to and adhered to Kabul. As the Mongols started to become more united, their foreign relationship with China also would become more developed. The Jin Dynasty invited Kabul to China in 1125 to attend Emperor Zizong's coronation. As part of this coronation, there would have of course been a large party flowing with as much meat and wine and all sorts of other delicacies of the time. Not used to the more potent drinks, Kabul managed to get himself horribly drunk at this event. He started running around, patronizing servants, and just causing a general ruckus through the whole event. And then when the new emperor went to bed, Kabul was able to sneak into his quarters and chop his beard off while he slept. Obviously, the new emperor didn't take well to this type of behavior, and so when Kabul left, Emperor Zizong sent his army after Kabul. Kabul caught wind of this army tailing him and decided to lay a trap and ambushed the emperor's army with his men, killing every single man. This led to a brutal seven-year war between the Mongols and the Jin Dynasty in China. Back in Mongolia, the Jin Dynasty didn't have as much of a reach physically, so they activated their secret weapon, the Tartars, to launch attacks against the Mongols. However, Kabul had great military strength and was able to repel all of the attacks from the Tartars. By 1143, Ambagai succeeded Kabul in taking power over the Mongol tribes, and he took a very offensive stance against the Jin dynasty. Ambagai secured several forts along the Great Wall and forced the Jin's hand into suing for peace. So in return for vacating the fortresses at the Great Wall, the Jin's would have to pay very heavy reparations of sheep, cattle, and grain. Despite admitting defeat, the Jin's would not let it end there. And so, when Ambagai returned back to Mongol, the Jin's reactivated their secret weapon, the Tartars, and once again, they conspired another plot against the Mongols. When Ambagai returned back to Mongol, he decided that he would become this politically savvy leader, someone that not only had the military strength that he had, but someone that could be seen as someone who could play the political game as well. Ambagai thought it would be politically advantageous to his agenda to offer his daughter as a bride to the Tartars in an attempt to form an alliance between the two parties. The Tartars led Ambagai into believing that an alliance was forged in steel, and so the groundwork was started on producing this wedding. When Ambagai presented himself in front of the Tartar people, they simply captured him, and they sent him over to China to be dealt with by the Jinns. The Jinns treated him harshly, and shortly after his capture, the Jinns decided to crucify him on a wooden donkey. This assassination, this atrocity that took place, would never be forgotten by the Mongols, and it would come to haunt the Jinns decades later. For the Mongols, the next few years were known as the Dark Years, as the Tartars started to take an offensive stance against the Mongols, and they proceeded with their military strength against the weakened Mongolian tribes. 
it was by 1161 that Mongol was virtually ruled over by all of the Tartars. What remained of the Mongols was no better than a band of guerrillas, and they would occasionally rally behind a charismatic leader who could deliver spoils of war. And such, that was the way of life for the Mongols in the early 1160s. Ultimately, a man known as Yesugai rose to power within this crumbling Mongol province, and he really didn't have much ties to the royal line of Kabul, but people followed him due to his innate charismatic character. Yesugai knew that the strength of the Mongols was extremely diminished and that they wouldn't be able to outright overthrow the Tartar invasion. So to compensate for his weakened state, he decided to form an alliance with the Karit, who was the second most powerful province within the Confederation of Mongolia. So Yesugai met with a man known as Togril, and Togril was the leader of the Karits. And Yesugai believed that he could gain the support of Togril based on the fact that at a very young age, Togril was enslaved by the Tartars. So he invoked sympathy on the behalf of the Mongols and utilized Togril's past to try and persuade the Karits to side with Mongol. To officially forge their alliance, Yesugai would have to carry out an act of loyalty for Togril, and in turn, he would have to go ahead and murder two brothers of Togril that were vying for power. When this took place, and an uncle of Togril came to know uh, the events that unfolded, he decided to start a rebellion in the Karit province. And the people rose up against their tyrant leader, Togril, and ran him out of the province with merely a hundred retainers at his back. However, despite the tragic situation that was going on in Karit, Yesugai decided to remain loyal as a blood brother of Togril. To make the story sound a little easier for you guys, essentially what happened was the Mongols were under a pretty significant threat from the Tartars, and the Tartars were very successful after the assassination of Ambagai at covering over all of the lands of Mongol. The Mongols themselves were pretty much barely holding on as a province, and really, they almost disintegrated into nothing until one man known as Yesugai decided to rise up and lead the Mongols over to Karit, where they met up with this man and they formed an alliance. However, the land that they came across was also fairly war-torn, and unfortunately, the Karits were starting to disassemble themselves, and the man that they backed had to run from his own province as well. So, here we have two different leaders from two different provinces, essentially uprooted from their own lands. But these two separate leaders, Yesugai and Togril, decided to stick together, and they were successful at running a military campaign back in Karit and overthrowing the uncle who stood in the place of Togril. Along the way with this journey, Yesugai would involve the Mongols in a rather bitter feud with the Merkits, uh, who at this time really didn't have any strife against the Mongols. Yesugai was used to the Mongol customs and traditions that when they traveled, they were traveling to try and find a suitable wife along the way. And what happened was Yesugai essentially stumbled upon a Merkit tribe and he found a woman named Holin and 
he found Holin to be a very beautiful woman, and despite her already being married to a husband, he decided to take her anyway because that was the Mongol customs and traditions that even if you had to steal the wife that you wanted, you would do whatever it took. And so, Yesugai stole a 15-year-old girl whose name was Holand. And the person she was married to just so happened to be the market leader. This kidnapping, so to speak, enraged the markets, and this is what started a long-time feud between the markets and the Mongols. It was under all of these circumstances that we've laid out over the past 20-ish minutes that in 1162, Holin and Yesugai together gave birth to a little boy whose name was Temujin, who would grow up to become Genghis Khan. And I know you're probably asking yourself, why has it taken nearly 30 minutes to simply mention the name in the birth of Genghis Khan, when that's what this entire episode is supposed to be about, Genghis Khan's uprising. But you have to understand that Genghis Khan wasn't born into this royal family and instantly given all of the privileges that would be adhered to someone of royal blood, but he was really born into a failing tribe, a tribe of rebels that were essentially just fighting to survive. Now, because he was such a great conqueror and leader, there were many legends and folklore that surrounded his birth. Some people would claim that he came into the world clutching a blood clot in his fist, or that he was conceived when a ray of heavenly light shined into his mother's womb. But no, none of this, of course, was true. Temujin was just born into the Mongol tribe by a woman who was stolen from the Merkit tribe, and essentially... He was born into an environment where there were many people out against the Mongols. Temujin got his name from the recently captured chieftain of the Tartars. In an attempt to transfer that title and power over to the new son. As a young boy, Temujin learned and grew up essentially the same way as many other young Mongols of the time. They would learn to ride horseback at a very young age and hone their skills in archery and hunting. And an interesting fact to note is that the Mongols didn't really have a focus or a priority on education. And so for Temujin and later Genghis Khan's life, he was actually illiterate, unable to read or write. By the time Temujin reached the age of nine, Yesugai realized that there was a need for Temujin to become betrothed. Mongols were arranged in engagements early in life to add to the prestige of the family and clan. And so the Mongols would go from one Mongol tribe to the next to try and arrange a marriage. Oftentimes, these marriages were arranged with the Anjarad tribe. And so in order to arrange this, Yesugai and Temujin would have to travel far and wide, crossing the Gobi Desert to the land of Anjarad, which was located in southeast Mongolia. Within the Anjarad tribe, there were two different clans known as the Nurjin and Boskyor people. Yesugai went to the chieftain of the Nurjins to propose a marriage with the chieftain's 10-year-old daughter, Borte. It was customary that a wife was bought, and even though Yesugai was a chieftain himself, he had no real money to offer and could only offer a single horse in return for this bride. So 
the proposal was ultimately rejected by the Nurgen chieftain. While the proposals were underway, Temujin went to work making friends with a boy whose name was Alchi Noyan. Alchi Noyan just so happened to be the Boscure's leader's son, and Alchi Noyan begged to have Temujin added to the Boscure family. Obviously, the Nurgen chief wouldn't want to lose Temujin as a potential betrothal to his daughter, and so he instantly decided to change his mind on the marriage and accept Temujin into his family on a couple of conditions. One, the horse would be used as a down payment, and the rest of the price must be paid in full before the marriage would continue. And then two, Temujin will have to remain in Anjurad and work and his labor will help pay for the interest that was accrued on the debt owed to the Nurgen chieftain. So for the next several years, Temujin would spend his time working as a herder for the Nurgen chief while Yesugai set out back home. However, Temujin's time in Anjarad was not a fruitless endeavor, but in fact, he learned a lot about debt and how oftentimes that debt would lead to feuds between families. And so, three years passed and Temujin grew to the age of 12. And everything changed for him when Temujin received news that his father, Yesugai, was slain by the Tartars. Yesugai was in the Tartar lands with an entourage of men, and the Tartars saw an opportunity to invite the Mongols in for a great banquet for all the men. Yesugai knew better than to outright refuse to attend this banquet, and so he reluctantly went, and Sloactin poison was injected into Yesugai's food. And shortly after leaving the banquet, Yesugai fell ill with cramps in his stomach and agonizing pain, and his last wish was for Molik, one of the men in his entourage, to bring Temujin back home. Monglik knew time was against him when Temujin was not present and his father, who was the chieftain of their tribe, was dead. And so there would be rising tensions within Temujin's own tribe as to who would succeed to rise as the next chieftain. Unfortunately, they were not quick enough returning back to the Borjigit tribe, and Temujin's own tribe wanted nothing to do with him. He was a 13-year-old boy and could not possibly offer the same influence, strength, and spoils of war as a full-grown man. And so, Temujin's mother, Holin, tried to stake his claim, but she was ultimately rejected on multiple occasions. In accordance with Mongol customs and laws, when Yesugai passed, his wife, Holin, was supposed to marry the younger brother, who in this case was Dari Tai. Holin rejected Daritai, and this humiliated him so much so that he would conspire with the Taiyuchai clan and overthrow the Borjigit clan. The Taiyuchai clan resumed leadership over the Mongols, and everywhere Holin went, backs were turned to her. Holin, Temujin, their family and a small set of men that remained loyal to Temujin and Holin were set out with a half dozen horses and abandoned. They were exiled from their tribe and left to wander the wilderness. Their life was abysmal, forced to survive on wild berries, roots, and whatever wild game they could find in the wilderness. And then when winter hit them, Times became even more rough and harsh as they could no longer find the wild berries and they would survive on boiled millet, which was tall, small-seeded grass that was essentially a grain that they 
crushed up and tried to put into some form of gruel or anything that would keep them alive. As time went on, the relationship between Temujin and his older half-brother Bedker began to degrade, and in the wilderness, Bedker asserted himself as the stronger brother, and anything Temujin caught in the wilderness, Bedker would prey on and steal from Temujin. This led to a day when Temujin was out fishing, and he caught a uh, rather large fish. Bedker showed up, and he snatched the fish out of Temujin's hand, and proceeded to both cook and eat the fish right in front of Temujin. This act pushed Temujin over the edge. Furious, he plotted his own brother's death. He snuck up on Bedker and proceeded to fire multiple arrows at him. This was Temujin's first real act of violence, brutality, and his first murder. When Holin caught wind of this, she was absolutely outraged. Becker technically wasn't even her real biological son, but a son of Yesugai's past. But this made no difference. She said, listen, son, you could either spend your time here fighting and killing each other, or we could take our anger and take vengeance against the Taiichids, or the Tartars who killed your father, my husband. As time progressed from this incident, Temujin and his family began to thrive somewhat in the wilderness. Back in the Taiichid clan, Targutai was the man leading them, and in turn leading all of the Mongols. Temujin started to become an ever-pressing threat to Targutai's reign. Targutai was hoping that Temujin and his whole family would just belittle into nothing and die out in the wilderness, and that wasn't the case. And so he had to try and find a, another way to get rid of this little problem he had on his hands. He knew that he couldn't just outright kill him because that wouldn't be clean, and so he organized a party to arrive in the hopes of enslaving Temujin. Temujin was alerted to this party that was on its way to pay a visit to Temujin and his family. And so Temujin went on a run. He abandoned his family and ran off into the wilderness alone. For six days, Temujin was avoiding capture and surviving solely on water. Without food for nearly a week, his body started to react desperately for food, and he was starting to break down due to starvation. After 72 hours without food, the body will run out of its own fuel and will literally begin to cannibalize itself from the inside out. Fast forward an additional 72 hours and we can see that Temujin's body was beginning to essentially shut down on himself. So he ran out in hopes of finding food. But this was a big mistake on Temujin's part and he was caught and captured by the raiding party. Temujin was placed in a device known as a kangu, which was this device with a board, and it had a hole inside of this board that was just large enough to squeeze your head up into, and your hands were fastened as well, and this kept your mobility extremely limited. In some cases, prisoners were at the mercy of passerbyers to feed them or give them water. The Taichid made the mistake of not only housing Temujin in a less restrictive kangu, but only guarding him with one young man. And so on one night, Temujin snuck up to the guard and clubbed him to death, and then proceeded to go on the run. While he was back out on the run in the wilderness, Temujin ran into a sympathizer of the Borjigit clan, who gave him food, drink, shelter, and armed him with a bow and arrow, aiding his escape. When Temujin returned to his mother's encampment, he found that it was raided 
by the Taiyuchids, and all but one horse were gone. Temujin set out on a path of vengeance against the Taiyuchid raiding clan, or raiding party, and decided to take that one horse with him to find his mother. Along the way, Temujin befriended a boy whose name was Borchu. And with the help of Borchu, they tracked down the Taiyuchi party, and they killed every last man. And so set off a grand relationship for Temujin, and a series of raids he carried out across the lands of Mongolia, slowly gaining a name for himself and gaining riches. On one account, there was a report where he killed six brigands all by himself in an ambush. After some time, in 1178, Temujin was able to accrue enough money to be able to pay for his wife, Borte. And so he set off to claim her, traveling yet again across the Gobi Desert. When he arrived, there was a wedding feast already assembled for him, and it was said to be well-flowing with a river of kumis and plenty of food to indulge upon. However, Temujin's short successes were quickly belittled when they had a run-in with the Merkit province once again. You see, the Merkits were still really pissed off and wanted revenge against the capture of Holand. If you recall, Yesugai, who was Temujin's father, stole Holand from the Merkits and... Holin eventually gave birth to Temujin, and this caused a rift between the Merkits and the Mongols. And so the Merkits organized a raiding party, some 300 strong, and launched an attack on Temujin's campgrounds. Caught off guard and wildly ill-prepared, they all scattered and fled, but Borte, Temujin's new wife, was unable to escape. It became clear later on that Temujin simply just abandoned her. This marked a very scornful and low point in the future conqueror's career. Temujin came to realize that the Merkits were behind Borte's capture, not the Taiyuchid, and this sole event was what set the path of revenge for Temujin against the Merkits. He couldn't take on the three powerful clans of Merkits, however, so he looked to ally with Togril once again, offering himself as an adopted son, showering him in gifts, and working on the back of Yesugai, his father, he was able to get Togril's complete support. However, studies revealed that Togril was persuaded by more than just gifts and promises, the Naimans, who were the most powerful province in all of Mongolia, they were growing even stronger, and they were a natural enemy of Karit. And so, when the Karit leader saw the opportunity of siding with Temujin, who would take down the Merkits and take back his own tribe and province, he saw an opportunity at maybe forming a useful allegiance. So Togril amassed a force of what the Karit claim was half a million men strong against the Merkits. And between 1180 and 1181, there was intense fighting that broke out across the lands of Mongolia. This war was fought hard for a whole year, and Temujin and the Karits claimed a decisive victory. This war was fought for Borte's recovery, and when they found her, she was pregnant. In a form of poetic justice, the Merkits gave Borte to her original husband's younger brother. And he just so happened to impregnate Borte. Temujin's wrath was harsh on all of the raiders. He essentially killed anyone that took part of the raid and enslaved their wives. 
And even though Borte gave birth to an illegitimate child in 1182, Temujin still took him in and named him Jochi and adopted him as his own son. Temujin ruled based on the policy of meritocracy, which essentially is which is different from an autocracy where there is a bloodline that you follow. So you would have like a king and then their children would be in line of successes and so on and so forth. And it kept power within a single family. This new policy that Temujin adopted would essentially allow anyone to become powerful within this structure. And it was based solely on your works within the tribe or within the clan. So the more good you did for the overall benefit of the people, the higher social ranking you would hold within that tribe or within that grouping of people. This stuck very well for Temujin, and it would make a lot of sense for Temujin to adopt this policy because he himself wasn't born into power. He had to fight for power himself. And so he was just essentially taking that idea and running with it. And ran with it he did because this idea was very successful for Temujin. After reclaiming Borte from the markets, Temujin was able to reunite with a childhood friend named Jamuga, who was able to cunningly and ruthlessly rise to power himself to become chieftain of the Jadarad tribe in Mongolia. However, he was hailed greatly as a prideful man, and that turned him into a loose cannon. He pulled out of the Merkit campaign early, and generally did whatever he wanted to. Remember, there were multiple tribes within the Mongol province, not just the Borjigid and the Taichid and the Anjarad, but you also had the Jadarad, and there were a few more out there that were significant in this story. Temujin felt that he needed Jamuga as an ally, and so... They shared memories together, they would drink together, and they would even sleep in the same beds together. It was definitely an interesting sight to see two different nomadic tribes so close to each other, their leaders sharing so much time together. But in 1183, it all began to make sense. Jamuga started an argument with Temujin over horse breeders, and that priority should be placed on the horses. And this opened up an array of arguments in which they further disagreed with each other. And at the deepest level, it became clear. They were trying to fight for who's the person that has power, who's the one that has real influence over the Mongols. And in reality, they were trying to see who was going to be the one to reunite the Mongol province. This led to a supreme council held by all the Mongol clans and tribes. They all got together and decided to debate this matter and figure out who would be the one that was right to rule over the Mongols. Everyone attended with the exception of the Taichid to determine who would be the rightful ruler. The elders were more conservative men. They believed more in tradition and they believed more in the autocratic kind of system that was instilled virtually everywhere else in the world. And so they tended to side more with the conservative ideas of Jamuga, while the younger rulers who were more adept to change and willing to accept more radical policies, sided more with Temujin. You have to understand the generation that grew up with Temujin, they lived a life that was riddled with war between the Jins, the Merkits, the Tartars, and then even the Taiyuchid and Borjigit feud 
and this led to a recklessness and rebellion across the land. The younger generation grew accustomed to the idea of breaking ties with traditional laws, and this was a driving reason why they supported Temujin. This led to a sudden break and rift between the Temujin supporters and Jamuga supporters. Temujin immediately readied 13 units and got ready for war, preparing them for battle if need be. Temujin tried to change as much as he well could about the lifestyle of the Mongols, even changing so much as how the layout of a traditional camp was. In traditional Mongol fashion, a camp would be made out in a grid pattern, where Temujin redesigned the camp design to be more conical or a circular pattern where Temujin was in the middle, representing that he had the most power within that tribe. However, Jamuga still was able to retain the support of the tribes Tayuchid, Jeljud, Arulad, and Anjarad, and he maintained power based on social ranking as opposed to merit. In terms of sheer size, Temujin actually had the numbers. As former rivals of Temujin came to learn about this meritocracy system, they slowly started to adopt that policy and come to support Temujin. As this euphoria for Temujin began to rise, so did his power. And it all came together in 1186 when Temujin was hailed as Khan of the Borjigid. This, in the history of all the Mongols, was unprecedented. This was the first time a man with no hereditary background, a man who, for lack of a better word, was nobody, came from slavery and rose all the way to the top. But in the grand scheme of what he would accomplish... This was just the beginning. I thank you for listening to this podcast. Please feel free to leave a review on whichever medium you are using. And in the interim, what I've decided to do was make a Twitter account to help bridge the gap between episodes. So feel free to follow on Twitter at Deadly Dynasties. And I'll be posting updates as to when the next episode is going to be released. And giving you all sorts of information along the way. So I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you continue to enjoy this journey as we go through Genghis Khan's life and legacy.